Hello and welcome to Brooks TV. I'm Sam. And I'm Nikki. Coming up in this week's episode. The council is clamping down on student housing. I meet with local Labour MP Andrew Smith to discuss student issues. And we look at the closing of Morals Bar on Clyde Booth campus. But first we have a report on how changes in local housing policy are affecting the wallets of the students and landlords. James Pepper has more on the subject. The season has changed and a frost has descended on Oxford. It's during these cold winter months that you really appreciate the roof over your head, but new changes to the housing multiple occupancy legislation could cause rent prices to soar. The HMO licence was introduced in 2004 in shared houses to control the number of tenants in a property. If the property has over four occupants, then it must adhere to certain conditions. Every door must be a two-hour fire door. B-plus grade combi boiler, wash basin for each room, lock for each room and a dead locking front door. There must be two or more bathrooms. Now Oxford City Council is proposing that all shared houses with more than two occupants will need to obtain an HMO licence. Local landlord David O'Neill tells us more. In a way I feel they're good because it promotes safety within the student housing market and, and the, the housing market for sharers as well but at the same time I, it feels to be another dig at landlords. One of the things that I will have to do um, for my, my student property is that we will have to put fire doors on each of the habitable rooms as well as that we'll have to put automatic door closers uh, like the ones in hotels on, on each of those and that will probably cost around £150 a room so it, it will be quite a costly thing to do. So some of the costs involved are the HMO licence comes in at £362, fire doors can be £70 to £100 each double glazing in the region of £1,800 and wash basins £100 each. This could total around £2,672 per property. To find out what all this will mean for students, I came here to Oxford Brooks Accommodation Office to speak to Pete Toomer. The main, main problem for students with relation to these uh, legislation changes is that their costs will increase. Now in Oxford particularly, the housing costs are relatively expensive compared to the national level so any further increases um, which are passed on to the tenants are going to make it even further uh, more disproportionate to the rest of the country so um, what is already an existing uh, expensive city is going to increase in cost even further uh, compared to the rest of the country. I don't think the changes in legislation will take students out of the private housing sector um, it's still a competitive price option compared to non-housing options that are available to students. The university is taking quite a lot of steps to broaden the scope of their um, accommodation offering in terms of price location and style however there are still a significant proportion of students who wish to live in shared housing and I don't think these minor changes to legislation are going to impact on that in any significant way. With Oxford City Council so far unavailable for comment, it looks as though rent prices will be going through the roof and many of us students will be left out in the cold. This is James Pepper for Brooks TV News. A very interesting report there. Awful to hear that housing prices may be going up in the future though. OK, next up we have an interview with East Oxford Labour MP Andrew Smith. Nikki spoke with him earlier in the week. I'm here today with Oxford East MP Andrew Smith. Andrew, thank you very much for coming in today. Pleasure. Um, I'd first like to find out more about the five-point plan to get the economy back on its feet. Please could you summarise this for our audience? The important thing is to get growth going in the economy because it's the lack of growth which is both causing unemployment and driving the deficit still higher. So Labour is proposing measures to tax bankers' bonuses to get 100,000 right. young people okay. into jobs, some VAT cuts, bringing forward some infrastructure investment and giving new businesses a national insurance holiday in recruiting new people. 
Brilliant, okay. Um, one of the points is building these school buildings. How do you plan to fund these? Well, you know, what it actually is, is to bring forward investment projects which are already in the pipeline. Right. And, yes. and what happens often with um, projects, whether it's school buildings or hospitals or road and rail, is actually there are delays. And what we're saying is government should do a quick audit of which projects are they a sort of shovel ready to go yeah. and just get on with them and accelerate work that's already planned to be spent on anyway because the construction industry is absolutely key both to generating jobs and stimulating wider growth. So the 100,000 jobs you plan to create, that's from the construction industry, is it? Or? No, no not, not solely. Oh. The 100,000 jobs could be in any area of the economy and we've said how we would pay for that by a higher tax on bankers' bonuses and it would be a requirement on young unemployed people to take one of the jobs on offer. So okay. it's not sort of a soft option. Yeah. Um, do you think the government should have any control over the bankers' bonuses? Of course government should exercise more control over bankers' bonuses. I mean, we've seen in the last few days, actually, how both uh, the RBS chair the and, and the chief executive have sort of been pressured to give up their bonuses. But it, it's not really a substitute for a general system which limits would limit bonuses which you know to most people especially in the present climate seem totally outrageous and I'm afraid the bankers who were in no small part responsible for the economic mess that we're in seem to have been totally out of touch with public opinion and so I think government needs to discuss with the banks a framework which is going to apply to them all and limit the bonuses. Okay brilliant. Um, youth and in particular graduate unemployment is at one of its highest ever levels and with tuition fees set to triple in cost this year, what do you think can be done to improve graduate employment? Well, the most important thing, as I was saying earlier, is actually to get more growth in the economy because it's lack of growth, lack of confidence in the future, yeah. which is leading employers not to recruit people. And, and when employers put on a recruitment freeze, one of the first people to suffer are graduates and young people. So we need to get growth moving more and um, you know, I'd like to see, obviously, a slower rate of cuts in areas of the public service that recruit young people. I mean, you know, to be cutting back on the recruitment of nurses and physiotherapists, doctors, police personnel, you know, almost wherever you look, there are big cutbacks taking place. And I think the pace of that should be slowed. Yes, we do have to address the deficit. We have to bring down the annual deficit but it should be done at a more measured and steady pace and that way we could generate more graduate and other jobs as well. Part two of the interview will be after the break. Thanks Nikki. Okay now we'll go over to our correspondent Paul for a story on student accommodation in Oxford. The Cowley Road area is considered one of the student hubs of Oxford. With its variety of shops, bars and restaurants, it has a lot of selling points for students when selecting where to live after their first year of university. However, with so many students choosing private accommodation over halls, both universities have gone over the cap set out by Oxford City Council. The council has threatened to stop the universities from moving into new facilities if targets are not reached, and we went to find out a little bit more about the situation at hand. I'm here on Divinity Road, one of the most popular streets for private student accommodation. However, with a shortage of family housing across Oxford and an increasing demand for council properties, many feel that more university-owned accommodation should be provided to free up housing for permanent residents. With this in mind, let's take a look at the facts. There are 57,800 houses in Oxford, of which only 56% are owner-occupied. The other 44% is made up of private and social rented properties and there were 3,611 Oxford Brooks students in private accommodation between 2010 and 2011. The low rate of owner-occupied housing in Oxford would appear to justify the cap, but Head of City Development at Oxford City Council Michael Crofton Briggs said that from the council's point of view it starts as a housing issue as there is a lot of pressure from within the city particularly to make room for the workforce. It is also significant for local residents who are surrounded by private accommodation where the community spirit may not be as strong. Students and residents had their own thoughts on the matter. 
obviously we all chose to move out because you do halls for the first year and that's nice it gets you set up and everything yeah, but accommodation. Yeah, and people should have the option like I don't think it's fair for students like they've come down here for uni like the least um, that can be provided for them is like more options you know to stay in different places Having lived in this area for more than 30 years now, which makes me very old, um, I am aware that it does break up the feeling of local community and I think you want to keep the balance of families and young people and old people. And the trouble with students, they're great to have around them, no objection, but they're transient. Where I live, there are an awful lot of students along the same road and you could definitely tell the difference between student houses and non-student houses. I went down to the Gypsy Lane campus at Oxford Brooks to speak to the Director of Corporate Affairs, Anne Gwynedd, about what is being done. We have been very focused on the accommodation issues, so it's not just about adding additional rooms, it's been about looking at the kind of accommodation that we're offering. Um, we're going to be offering next year 1,200 spaces for continuing students and that's something that we've not been able to do before because obviously uh, we've prioritised accommodation for first year students um, but with having additional rooms coming on stream we're now opening that up to continuing students and really looking at the kind of accommodation that would attract them. On the surface it would seem that the council has been putting pressure on the universities to reach their targets. But in the case of Oxford Brooks, progress is being made and targets will likely be reached. Despite most students choosing to move out of halls after their first year, new university accommodation developments offer many benefits which could help change the minds of those who were otherwise considering private accommodation, which could in turn help ease the tensions between students and residents. This is Paul Farker reporting for Brooks TV. That's it for this half, but still to come. Chris reports to us in the latest local sports developments. And we have the second part of our interview with Andrew Smith. Welcome back. Coming up now, we have part two of our interview with Labour MP Andrew Smith. What do you think of the new housing licence that's been introduced to Oxford landlords recently? Oh, it's absolutely essential. The ability to bring in this licensing scheme is something I campaigned for very hard in Parliament and I'm very pleased that the City Council's been able now to do it. And the important thing is that this will raise standards not only in the interests of neighbours and communities where there's lots of houses in multiple occupation, but actually to the benefit of the tenants, many of whom are students um, as, as well. And, you know, some of the houses in multiple occupation that you see, you know, the standards really are poor <laughs> and they need driving up. The other thing I strongly support is the um, campaign which is being run both by the Brooks Student Union and by the Oxford University Student Union to put back the date when rented properties are released because it's now in November and if you've got first years who have like hardly got to know one another and they've got to decide who they're going to share a house with, I think putting that back to Easter would help a lot of students and I've written to all the main letting agencies urging them to do that. That's really good. Um, Oxford City Council have recently told the universities that if they don't lower the number of students living in private accommodation they'll be blocked from moving into new buildings in the future. They want Oxford Brooks specifically to lower the numbers from around 3,700 to under 3,000. Do you agree with these rules? Yes, I do, because these, these are not arbitrary caps on the student numbers living out in, in residential property. They've actually been discussed, negotiated with the universities, and it's something which the universities are committed to. So what the City Council is saying is they're holding the universities to the commitment that they've made. You know, there's a question of balance here overall. I think this is, this is the important thing, that both universities and all their students contribute an enormous amount to the city, and I'm very sort of pro that co contribution. It's part of what makes Oxford what it is, dynamic, vital, energetic, you know, young, exciting um, city. Obviously, though, the demands on housing at a time when there's an acute housing shortage in the Oxford area is something that's got to be managed. So it's right that the universities provide a higher proportion than they have in the past of accommodation in purpose-built premises. And again, to be fair, 
to them. You look at Brooks, the number of student halls that have been built over the last 10 years, they have been doing that. And all this um, limit that the City Council is now enforcing is saying, let's implement the agreement that we agreed, and I'm sure the universities will try and do it. New parking restrictions are being enforced around the Divinity Road area. Uh, is this necessary or just a money-making scheme that will affect students the most? Um, it, it hasn't actually come in yet. Um, it's, it, it's a proposal and it's something which um, is very strongly supported by the residents in that area. Or perhaps I should say most of the residents because there may be student residents who maybe aren't so keen um, on it. And I, I use those terms because very often in the debate, students are talked about like they're not residents, and they are. They're every bit as much residents as anybody else. And again, back to the thing of balance, um, you, you've got to have a community which can accommodate a diversity of, of interest. But if you look at the Divinity Road area, there is a chronic parking problem around there. It does have to be sorted, it does have to be controlled. There are some other parts of the city that have said, no, we don't want a controlled parking zone. But that area has said they want it. And I think in a democracy, local government's got to listen to local residents. And so okay. therefore I support it. Andrew Smith, thank you very much thank for coming you. in today. Always a pleasure to talk with students. If you want to watch the full interview, you can find it on our website. So how was Andrew in the interview? He's actually a really nice guy. Speaking of nice guys, here's Barnaby Austin with a report on the future of morals. This year, Oxford Brookes University marks the 20th anniversary of Morals Bar, located at Clive Booth Halls. Change is in the air, however, as it has been announced that Morals Bar will be closing for business at the end of this semester. Why is this happening, and are there any plans for a replacement bar? Firstly, I want to find out how important Morals Bar is to current residents of Clive Booth Halls. I think it's very important to have a student bar. I think it enhances the student experience. Yeah, yeah I'd say it's quite important because yeah, it's, it's just easy, sort of like the football and rugby on today. Like, you just meet your mates, have a pint. So it's a good way of meeting people as well. Because the nearest one otherwise is a sports bar, and then that's it, a pub. Having a student bar is extremely important. Yeah, I mean it brings everyone together. I've met all my flatmates for next year, housemates, and everything in this bar. So yeah. Despite its apparent popularity, students are choosing to splash out elsewhere in Oxford. It could be that university bars are losing business to the Cowley Road area, with clubs and bars like here at the O2 Academy, which hold student nights like Fuzzy Ducks and Propaganda, which are very popular with the students. Various independent bars offer very competitive prices in order to encourage students to venture out into town. I organised a meeting with Student Union President Paul Mason to ask him the reasons for the Morals Bar closure, as well as whether anything is being planned as a replacement. So Paul, why is Morals Bar closing down? The main reason for closing Morals Bar is mainly down to uh, financial reasons. Unfortunately, over the last five years, uh, Morals Bar has been losing about £50,000 a year. Unfortunately, it's just not sustainable. Mm. Given the current economic climate, not necessarily the best way of spending our resources is on bars. Um, we, I think it's better to spend our money uh, on society, safety buses, our advice centre, and kind of looking after students. I believe it is important to have uh, SU spaces, uh, not necessarily SU bars. I mean, I think uh, this SU has concentrated more on representation, uh, support services and societies and safety bus. and I think that's probably a better way of um, spending our money. There is plenty of other um, bars and nightclubs in, this, in the city centre. The SU will be moving into the, the, the new uh, library and teaching building. Uh, we'll be right in the, uh, the centre of it, just next to the library, and there will be a bar catering provision of some kind. After speaking to Paul, it is good to hear that there are plans for a replacement bar in the new building at Gypsy Lane campus. The real shock was the discovery that Morals Bar had been losing such a vast amount of money on a yearly basis. With this in mind, I wanted to get the opinion of a long-standing Morals customer. My name's Jock Coates. I've been a warden on site down here at Moral Hall and since then Clive Booth Hall for 15 years now. And most of that time I've been coming here off and on. Over those years, it's, it's obviously changed in the way it's used and things like that, but uh, I think it's still a necessity, um, even if not perhaps in the same configuration as it is now. Uh, when this place was full with it, at capacity at 550 people, there were 450 people lived on this site. Now we have 1,700 people live on this site. So regardless of whether people from other halls are going elsewhere, we ought to be able to have the custom around locally to, to fill this place if we, if we tried hard. 
Despite the false hopes of current Morals customers, it's clear from the SU that the bar will still close at the end of this semester. So as the sun is setting on this Oxford Brook student bar, we can be safe in the knowledge that there will always be other bars accommodating for students elsewhere in Oxford. This is Barnaby Austin reporting for Brooks TV. Such a shame to see Morals go. Where are the poor freshers going to drink now? Anywhere, probably. OK, next we have a look at how recent weather has affected sporting events in and around the Oxford area. The recent cold weather, snowfall and frozen pitches has been causing problems for many of Brooks' sports teams. We were going to bring you slalom skiing, but that got cancelled because of the snow. We were going to bring you Oxford varsity football, but that got postponed because of the weather. So how have these cancellations across the county affected sports teams? Brooks TV investigates. With snow-covered grounds turning into waterlogged pitches, training has been cancelled for hockey, football, lacrosse, rugby league and union. I talked to Brooks Bulls captain Stuart Clark to see if it's affected his team. It's affected our training sessions. Three out of uh, possible three sessions this week have been cancelled. Wednesdays, normally a game day, but no games were trained. So the snow, frozen pitches and even the all-weather AstroTurf, which or where there's not particularly a great name for it as it got frozen over because of the bad weather. So we haven't trained at all, which is not good for us as we have a second team cup game coming up against Cambridge a uh, week Wednesday and the first team playing in Oxford. So we need all the, the training preparation we can for it. But Brooks teams aren't the only ones being affected by the cold snap. Oxford United have had their last two games postponed due to frozen pictures. I talked to right-back Andrew Wing to find out if a fortnight without a match has affected the team. Yeah, well, to be fair, we've worked quite hard the last couple of weeks. Um, obviously, we haven't played on grass for a couple of weeks because of the weather, so we've been you know, indoor on a 3G and at out outdoor Oxford City, so we've had some great facilities to work to work with. And um, No, we've, we've been working hard. We've, we've been pre preparing for the games before they got called off, so uh, we're just looking forward to the next game and hopefully um, you know, we can put the frustration of the last two weeks behind us and um, get a good result tomorrow. Okay, nice. So tr the training schedule hasn't been affected at all because of the weather? No, not really. We've Obviously we've got facilities elsewhere that we've used, uh, like indoor uh, 3D, uh, 3G pitch, sorry, and um, we've used them uh, and they've been fantastic for us, so um, you know, we've, we've been there preparing as well as, as anybody really. I also asked manager Chris Walder if he was confident going into the upcoming game against 22nd place Dagenham and Redbridge, having beaten them 1-0 in their last meeting. No, we had a tight game over there, so it's never the easiest place in the world to go and get a result. So, yeah, it'd be, be good to hopefully do the double over them. They're, they're a tough side. They, they've struggled a little bit, I think, through, through a lot of injuries that they've suffered. Uh, so they've been badly hampered by that. But uh, as always, uh, you know, anybody who comes and watches us at, at our place, you know, people... Teams that come to, to come to the ground always seem to have an extra yard into the step and uh, and want to do well because of the, the facilities and, and the decent crowd that we'll have on the night. With the cold weather retreating, sporting schedules are returning to normal, leaving some teams unfazed, but others ill-prepared for critical games. This is Christopher Senior for Brooks TV. Snow causing some issues there, but some games have taken place. Here are the results of the week. OK, up first, our men's basketball team secured 76-54 victory against Leicester University. The men's first hockey team lost 1-0 to Birmingham Thirds. Um, the women's netball team beat the University of East Anglia with a 47-33 win. We lost to our local friends, Oxford University, in the men's tennis with a 12-0 loss. And the women's volleyball lost to Birmingham 3-0. So that's it for this show. Remember, you can view all the previous episodes online by going to btv.brooks.ac.uk. We also want to hear about what's happening near you. Um, so please email your stories or questions to brookstv at brooks.ac.uk. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you.